and uh, it's my pleasure to chair this uh, session of papers that I can understand. Um, so <coughs> uh, the first paper is a, is a hierarchical memory management for parallel programming, uh, for, sorry, for parallel programs, and uh, Ram Raghunathan is going to give the talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm presenting. This is joint work with Stefan Muller, Omar Akar, and Guy Balak. So before we talk about hierarchical memory management for parallel programs, let's talk about quicksort. Quicksort is a functional program. It can even be a purely functional program, but is it parallel? And it turns out that it can be. As you step through and create the subcomputations, these naturally exhibit parallelism. And this is true for uh, all purely functional parallel uh, programs. They naturally exhibit parallelism. But this talk is about memory management. So how would this uh, call of quicksort look in practice? Well, if we split it out into the memory allocations, the topmost called quicksort will allocate the initial vector. It'll split it up into the two subvectors that are passed onto the subcomputations, so on and so forth. And even in this tiny, tiny example, we've already created six locations, six allocations. That's a lot. And this is true for all of these kinds of uh, programs and their implementations. They tend to allocate a lot of data. So while you can uh, write your parallel program rather nicely, it's hard to get high performance because memory management gets in the way. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about an efficient garbage collection of these functional parallel programs to achieve high performance. OK, so let's talk about the algorithm. We take the same image of quicksort that I showed you before with all the locations. And now let's have every subcomputation or task have its own heap. Every parallel task executes in its own heap. And once two child tasks can complete, their heaps can be merged back into the parent and before the parent resumes in that task. Now, I've talked about heap management so far. This is how we create these heaps, allocate memory, but we still need to collect them. And before I go into that, I want to illustrate a very fundamental property that enables really the rest of the paper. And that is this property that in pure uh, programs, all the pointers essentially go up. No task can have access to data that was allocated by siblings or grand siblings. It can only go up its, uh, up its list of ancestors. We call this property disentanglement. So, we have hierarchical heaps. We have disentanglement. What does collection look like? Now, what disentanglement allows is for a leaf heap to be collected in parallel with other tasks executing. This is because the memory in scope of that collection cannot be accessed by any of the parallel executing tasks. And we can uh, continue on uh, this trajectory. We can have multiple leaves collecting independently of each other. And we can even have arbitrary subtrees being collected, again, in parallel with other tasks, either collecting or executing. So hopefully by now, I've illustrated the kind of algorithm that we're uh, going for. But I've focused on a very particular example, quicksort, this particular example of quicksort. Do we know whether this works for a more general case? And in order to do that, we developed a semantics. We developed a pure and parallel language, Lambda HP, which models hierarchical heaps and requires that all axes go up. And in the semantics, we prove that disentanglement and the memory safety of hierarchical GC is true for all programs written in this language. So let's look at what Lambda HP looks like. It starts off as a fairly familiar Lambda calculus. It, uh, we have large values, which are the only kind of values that can be in heaps. Heaps themselves are simply maps from locations, which are analogous to pointers and implementation, and uh, to the values. And we have heap paths, which are essentially lists of heaps. I'm going to get back to this in a moment. Finally, the expressions consist of standard terms along with a parallel term that consists of two tasks. And tasks themselves consist of an expression and an associated heap. So in doing so, we have a tree of tasks, each of, each of which has their own associated heap, just like I described before. Now let's talk about those paths again. We have paths and we construct them so that they are a stack of heaps of the local expression from the local expression all the way up to the root. So in this diagram, for example, the path that's associated with the expression E2 and the task of that expression is both H2 and H. It does not include H1. Now, 
if we set up paths like this, and we have uh, set up the semantics so that heap accesses can only go up the paths, then it naturally follows that if the heap access or lookup function never fails, never gets stuck, then disentanglement must hold, because lookup can only work on those heaps in a path, which is uh, the disentangled list. So hopefully by now I've talked about Lambda HP. We have parallel programs. We set up the semantics so that we can enforce disentanglement. Now, let's talk about how hierarchical collection works. We have a hierarchical GC that we're calling HGC. Now, you could use many different kinds of collectors. In our work, we focus on modeling a semi-space copying collector. In doing so, the task, the heaps that are associated with every task now doing collection blow up into four pieces. We have the from heap which is the heap that is to be collected and has some garbage in it. We have the scan set, which is the current frontier of locations to be scanned and copied. And these are all copied into the to heap, which will be the resulting heap at the end of collection. And finally, we have a forwarding function that maps these uh, locations in the from heap to the corresponding locations in the to heap. In implementation, this, this usually is like a forwarding pointer that you would store at the object in the from heap. So now we have how the, the heap gets split up into these four constituent parts. How would we actually model copying collection, copying hierarchical collection in the semantics? Well, this is one gnarly rule. This rule it looks very complicated, but all it really does is it does a single step of the copy collection. It copies one uh, location from the from heap to the to heap. And I'm going to go through it step by step in order to uh, make that clear. So we start off by taking a location that is in the scan set, our frontier of locations to copy, and it points to some value v. In this uh, illustration below, the value v is essentially the pair of L2 as, uh, as well as L1. We then, since we're going to copy this location L, we need to create space for it in the two heap. So we allocate a new location L prime. At this point, we copy the value that L points to, namely the pair of L2 and L1, to L prime. However, notice that L1 was previously copied and now points to F of L1. So rather than have an L prime point though, we just shortcut it and let L1, L prime point to F of L1. This would essentially be um, during the copy collection, you notice that the object has already been forwarded and you just set your pointer there. Finally, we need to set up the forwarding map to include a mapping from location L to L prime so that the future copies know that this place has already been forwarded. So this is a single step of copy collection. It copies a single location and a copy, a complete collection would involve multiple of these steps until some kind of terminating condition. And it starts with some kind of start condition. So we model these as these two rules, start GC and end GC. Start GC uh, is very simple. All it does is it locks the, uh, the expression E so that it cannot evaluate any further while collection is in progress. And it sets the scan set to be the three locations in E. This corresponds to the root set in typical garbage collection vocabulary. Garbage collection then ends when there are no locations in the scan set that are also in the from heap. This is slightly different from regular copy collection where you simply continue, continue until the scan set is completely empty. However, since we have hierarchical heaps, multiple heaps, the, there could be locations in S that do not live in the from heap and therefore are not subject to the collection. So the end rule needs to be uh, refined into making sure that it's no locations that are in the from heap, in scope of collection, that remain. Before I move on, I just want to point out that this method of formalizing uh, the collector is based on Morissette, Felison, and Harper's work in abstract models of memory management. Okay, so we have Lambda HP, we have disentanglement, we have HGC. Now, how do we know that this all safe? How do you know that this all works? So let's intuitively think about what safety means. In disentanglement, by the way that we've constructed the semantics with the path and restricting lookups to only up the path, we know that if lookup never fails, then disentanglement holds. Similarly for memory safety, which means that we never collect a location that's still in use, we, uh, we set that if you access a freed location, then it's a stuck state. So if we try to formalize these two things into a theorem, 
all it ends up becoming is type safety, just a standard type safety theorem. And indeed, this is, this is what happens. If we can prove type safety, then we automatically get disentanglement and memory safety as corollaries. Now, there's still one subtle point, namely that while we have type safety, it doesn't guarantee that the program's meaning hasn't been changed uh, in the course of these steps. It doesn't ensure that when we do collection, we don't get a different answer than if we didn't. To prove this, we show corresponds between lambda HP and what we call a flattened semantics that removes heap from the program. These flattened semantics look a lot more like a typical lambda calculus. Uh, for more information on how we did this, please look at the paper. So we talked about the semantics. We have hierarchical heaps. We have hierarchical collection. We've shown that it all works. But the goal of this paper was to have an efficient uh, memory manager. So we need to see how this would work in implementation. However, in implementation, there are a couple of major practical considerations. The first one is that there needs to be a scheduler of some sort that assigns tasks to processors. In addition, memory itself is a shared resource. We cannot just come up with new locations and new memory out of thin air. So we need to manage it in such a way to reduce the contention. In the remainder of this talk, I'm going to speak about how we address this first concern of a scheduler. So for scheduling, we use a work stealing scheduler. Now, a work stealing scheduler uh, functions so that different programs can essentially fork tasks that are then put onto a queue. And if a processor ever becomes idle, it can steal tasks from other processors so that it can continue working. This is to ensure that processors are utilized as much as possible. And prior work on schedulers like this tells us that the steal operation occurs far, far less frequently than fork steal. And this, this observation informs our design. Sorry. We can afford to be slow during steal time, but we cannot be afford to be slow during forks. So let's look back at the semantics. We had a heap for every task. If we were to implement that in a work scaling scheduler, that means we create a heap on every fork. But we can't do that because forks themselves are, need to be fast. So we defer creating heaps to steals. We do this by consolidating memory into a structure that we call superheaps. Superheaps hold allocations from multiple directly descendant heaps, uh, di directly descendant tasks, apologies. And a new CPU heap is created for stolen tasks. Since we, this is an expensive operation, we're deferring it to the steal time. Now, this is all well and good, but if you remember, we want to be able to have every task work in its own heap, so, which means that we want to be able to determine which task allocated which object. So in order to do this, every super heap splits up all of its allocations into levels. Each level corresponds to a particular level in the task tree itself. So for example, in this gray super heap, we have three levels 0, 1, and 2. Each of these levels will, can be marked as activated when a corresponding steal happens. That means that the memory at that level is now shared among multiple processors. And finally, since these levels directly correspond to the levels in the task tree, within a single super heap, disentanglement holds between levels. So we have super heaps. They are created only on steel. They are split up into levels. How do we collect these? I'm going to talk about a specific version of collection called local collection. In local collection, we, take, we want to collect a single super heap, and we do it bottom up, level by level, in a, uh, until the last activated level. We cannot collect these activated levels because they are shared, and we're not synchronizing with the other processors to make sure we don't trample over their data. And since we go level by level, and disentanglement uh, holds between levels, we know that once a level is done, com uh, done collecting, like this green one at level two, we'll never have to go back and collect it again because there are no pointers down. Pointers only go up. So we go level by level, and then we're done. We went ahead and implemented this um, as an extension to Daniel Spoonhauer's extension to Milton, which adds fork join parallelism to uh, the Milton standard ML compiler. We, compiled, we compared our compiler, which we call Milton Parmem, against both Spoonhauer's compiler, which in terms of GC uses a simple parallel allocator and stop the world collector, and Manticore, which has a very sophisticated two-level memory management system. All three of these 
compilers were compared against a sequential baseline, which was essentially the same parallel program with the parallelism elided and compiled under Milton. So the first benchmark I'm showing you here is MemStress. MemStress is a synthetic benchmark that is designed to heavily stress the memory management system. It does this by allocating large, large lists and then releasing them immediately. The actual computation in between these allocations and the corresponding GCs that will occur is very minimal. So all of the effort of the, of the program is focused there. We notice here that Milton Parmem, the green line, happens to do fairly well, uh, beating Milton Spoonhauer handily and also beating Manticore. However, if you look a bit closely, you'll notice that Manticore has caught up to Milton Parmem by the time we hit 32 processors and kind of seems poised to take it over. This is a general theme that we found in most of our benchmarks. Manticore is designed and its focus is on scalability, and in fact, it does achieve this very, very well. However, its, it's overhead against a sequential one, like uh, our Milton compiled baseline, happens to be quite high. So it needs to use a lot of processes before it's able to overcome uh, that handicap. Another benchmark that I'm showing you here is sparse matrix vector multiply. This is a standard SMVM program that uses a parallel four construction. In this benchmark, Milton Parmem does very well, scaling very nicely, and beating both Spoonhauer and Manticore. And before you start thinking that Parmem is really good, and especially since this is a prod type uh, implementation, there are cases where it doesn't do quite so well. For example, a ray tracer program in which we render phi 12 by phi 12 scene, Manticore away and beyond beats everyone else. And indeed, this is, comes back to the argument I mentioned before where Manticore usually suffers from rather high overhead, so it needs a lot of process before it catches up. For this benchmark in particular, it did not suffer from this handicap, so it's really able to show off its uh, scalability. However, Parmem still does quite, respectable, uh, quite respectably. So in conclusion, in this talk, we presented a hierarchical memory management manager for parallel, purely functional programs in which we closely couple the memory manager to the program. We then use the kind of information that we can get out of this close coupling, such as disentanglement and knowing what tasks uh, allocate what objects to enable parallel collection. We also uh, express all of this in a semantics, the target language lambda HP, as well as hierarchical collection. And we proved key properties like disentanglement and the memory safety of uh, the language along with HGC. And finally, we implemented this in a Plod type implementation under, uh, for SML, which seems to show promising results. And we think we, it, it might be able to do even better. However, there are some things I didn't talk about. Um, so one thing that I touched upon was semantics preservation, namely that while you do GC, we know that it's safe, but does it change the answer? Does it change the meaning of the program? Um, this is something that if you're interested in, please look at the paper. In addition, we also go into in-depth detail about other aspects of uh, the practical design, such as how we dealt with memory contention and uh, implementing some important operations that need to be fast. And finally, there's also a more thorough analysis of both the three benchmarks that I presented as well as the others that we ran. In the future, there are multiple avenues for work. Um, one that immediately comes to mind is to look at other forms of parallelism. Our semantics and, well, not, not a semantics, our, our implementation really focuses on fork joint parallelism and all of its work surrounds that. However, there are other kinds, as has been talked about in other talks during ICFP, such as async finish and futures, and we would like to see how those paradigms of parallelism would work in, within hierarchical memory management. In addition, we currently don't support any mutable state at all. And indeed, that is one thing that allows us to get disentanglement so easily. Once you introduce mutable state, disentanglement um, does not immediately become so clear cut. So because mutable state is important to realize a lot of different programs, that is an important part of future work that we'd want to explore. That being said, it, there's still a lot of problems that can be expressed in a pure manner. Finally, we want to de uh, develop a more mature and more optimized implementation. Our implementation is quite the prototype, and it also doesn't support all the features that I may have touched upon today. 
we want to really work at it and see just how well do all of our ideas work um, in, in real life. Uh, thank you very much. That's all I have for you today. So we have <coughs> plenty of time for questions. Hi, John Hughes, Sharmish and Cubic. Am I right in understanding that when a stolen uh, computation terminates, the data structure that it returns has to be copied back into the caller's heap? Yes. So isn't there a risk then that if there's nested seeding going on, that you end up copying the same data structure over and over again? So one, one thing that's um, important is one, once you fork, you have child tasks, but you won't, uh, you, that parent task itself is halted until all the child tasks terminate. So once something is stolen and wants to return to the parent heap, at that point there's really just one task. So you won't be copying uh, the same thing multiple times. You just have to copy that, uh, the data from that one task back up. And indeed, this is also true that in a single super heap, the, which are split into levels, when a task returns, that level will be folded back into its parents as well. And Glenn Pergut from Google. Uh, have you evaluated how this model could work for some industry uh, quality uh, platforms? Uh, Erlang comes to mind because if you squeeze enough, uh, it, very often Erlang processes are actually structured into into trees which are heavily dependent on each other, and uh, the memory management there is a tricky part if you do. Uh, some extensive computations, you copy a lot of stuff between the levels. Uh, do you think this model would fit to the Erlang model? So ju just to make sure, the question is about whether this might work into an Erlang style uh, environment. We believe it can be, it can work. Um, it's certainly relatively self-contained. We think that uh, it is possible, for example, if um, Erlang had a facility for fork joint parallel programs just to use this kind of collector for that subcomputation. We believe so that thing could work, but we, not ha we haven't explored it. Yeah. Masahiro Yatsugi, Kyushu Institute of Technology, Japan. Uh, I have two, two questions. One is, uh, so this, uh, do you uh, know about silk process hyper object or reducers? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Reducers in Silk Plus. I'm sorry? Reducers. Reducers or hyper object. Oh. I'm afraid I would know very little about that. Right. Maybe uh, the, the hyper object automatically allocate to empty uh, to the identity. Maybe it's, it's just corresponding to empty heap. So it can be very related to, to your work. I, I, Okay. Okay. The, uh, the second question is, uh, uh, so you emphasize the uh, collector is, can be hierarchically, but uh, I, I, I think you can also emphasize the allocation is also can be in parallel. So, so in, in your formulation, it just, uh, in local, sorry, so allocator can or at least theoretically can be uh, allocated new memory yeah. in parallel. So it, that can be the important point of your work, I think. I'm sorry, but, uh, I didn't uh, quite understand the question. So not, not question, just yeah. uh, you can. All right. You can emphasize that. We should talk offline. Yeah. Uh, in Newton, Indiana University. Um, this is really interesting, and uh, one thing I'm wondering about is when you have a steal and then a join point after the steal, why does physical copying need to be associated with that returning? So if the, if the live fraction in the child heap uh, resulting from the steal uh, is still favorable, uh, that is, you, you still have a high percentage of live data, can't, can't you just kind of logically rejoin the parent heap without physical copying at that point? That's actually true, and that is basically what we do. So essentially, one thing that I didn't talk about in the talk is that our memory is, consists of essentially linked lists of chunks. Ah. <laughs> so when you actually want to merge these superheaps back or even merge back up a level 
all you do is append to lists. Right, lists of very large chunks. Yeah. Rather than heap objects. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So the benchmark numbers already reflect that. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, my other small question was for this benchmark suite of parallel SML programs, which I've seen a couple other times, uh, like in John's John's work, uh, is there a set of baseline implementations in Silk Plus or something to get a sense of constant factors? I. I imagine there might be. Um, a lot of the benchmarks that we did were adapted actually from the Manticore benchmark suite, which um, implements them both Manticore and SML. And I think a couple of them might have silk implementations. I'm not sure. Um, but that's certainly something that we'd like to look at in the future, like um, other languages like silk or even Java, and just see how it works in the, in the wider variety of things. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Sorry about that.